So um, uh, we're going to begin now with um, Greg's story from Dale Carnegie to talk about presentations. Dale Carnegie does, can I have your attention, presentations in English and in Japanese to help your business presentation skills, whether it's giving a, uh, talking about your business plan or talking in your company. So please, please pay attention to all the tips and his advice because it really helps you in your oral presentation. I do want to say the judges had their scores and they had like the top five teams and after the oral presentation it can all flip again. So your business plan counts for 60% and the, and the uh, oral presentation 40% so it's a lot. So take tips. There's a lot of people who are not here today for various reasons so make sure you discuss this with your team. We'll be putting the PowerPoint up on uh, the Kenja room after this. Um, but if you want to take an extra book for your teammates, please do that as well. So pay attention, and I will turn it over to the fabulous Dr. Story. Thank you very much, Betsy. Well, congratulations on getting your document submitted. As Betsy mentioned, that's only part of the way through, isn't it? If you've got 40% out there, that's huge. As I recall, the judges tell me that the margins are micro, micro, micro <coughs> thin on the business plans. It's not like there's a massive gap between the first, second, <coughs> third, fourth, fifth business plans. And as mentioned, the oral can completely flip that. 40% is a huge <coughs> amount of points to have there. So here's the issue. What's going to be different about what you do and your presentation that's going to make sure that your team gets to that number one position? And I suppose after so many months of hard effort, you would like to get something back at the end in terms of recognition and some of the prizes. And if you certainly are feeling exhausted from the process of getting your documents submitted, trust me, by the time you get to the evening the award ceremonies are on, you'll be pumped up. You will want to win something. It's a very exciting evening. I've been to I don't know how many of these. You'll find that your emotions will really be driving. But don't get to that point and leave points on the table because you didn't do a good enough job on your presentation. So try and get the most as you can from this. I've got a special web page for you on our site for JMEC you can go to. You can see this video presentation. You can see uh, PowerPoint, how to do PowerPoint. There's a Japanese version. There's an English version. So you're not just limited to those who are in the room today. If people are not here, they can go and watch those presentations, look at the PowerPoint, and be on track with that. This presentation is actually a full day program, successful public speaking, but we don't have a full day. We're going to do part of it today, and we're going to spend a lot of time in practice, a lot of time in practice later. Hence, there are no tables, so we can move the chairs around and get into threes and be in triads for the latter part of the day. So we'll begin. This is a study of 200 vice presidents done by the Wall Street Journal in the States. And like all of us in business, we hear a lot of presentations. What do people think about the quality of the presentations they've been hearing? Well, as you can see here, about 40%, so this is, uh, you can leave that on. 40% are boring. About 44% said, makes me sleepy. Only a very small number said, hey, these are stimulating. Now, you could look at this two ways. You can say, oh, it's impossible to be a great presenter. Or you can say, well, you know, with some training, with a bit of effort, I could be in this top 3% in my business field, in my profession, as a professional, who are excellent. When I look at that graph, I say the barrier to entry is pretty low. Most people are hopeless because they don't train, they don't invest any effort, they don't understand the importance of this. Through JMEC, you have the opportunity to hone different business skills through the program. 
This is the one skill that transcends all industries, transcends all professions, transcends all genders, age groups, ethnic backgrounds, the works. You're either good or you're in the boring and sleepy category. And the majority of presentations you probably see in your business career now, where you're working, are probably in the boring and sleepy category. You don't have to be there. So, today, let's get out of this group of boring and sleepy and get into the stimulating group. So, the program objectives, a professional presentation delivered with confidence. Confidence comes from skill, comes from knowledge, comes from practice. They're the three things we're going to concentrate on today. Understand the purpose and the structure for the presentations. Now, you have an oral presentation of your business plan. That is one purpose. But in business, you have many different purposes. So I'm going to cover from a broad business perspective, but then talk about the oral component. So you get both categories covered. We're going to practice some techniques for a dynamic opening and closing. First impression, last impression. Both are critical. We teach high impact presentation skills. When I ask the participants, how long does it take you to form an impression of someone you meet for the first time? They give me a number. How about in this audience, how many seconds does it take you to form an impression of somebody who you meet for the first time. Give me a number. What have we got? Three seconds. Three, yep. Five. Five, Five yep. Yeah. Everyone else is sleepy because of Saturday. <laughs> Three, five. Is that very long? No. Are we slow to unwind that first impression? We are, aren't we? We make a very rapid first impression judgment and we're very, very slow to unwind it. So what does that tell you? If you're a presenter, those first three, five seconds are going to be critical with your audience. And they are slow to change your first impression if it's a negative one. So we can't leave that to chance, can we? We've got to really design that make sure it works for us. And the last thing we remember is the last impression we have. So we don't leave that to chance either. So we're going to use evidence to convey credibility and reduce fear. When you have a viewpoint, which you have, you've come up with a judgment about a business and what they need to do. You have a viewpoint on that. You've assembled evidence to back up that view. You are confident in your viewpoint because you've done the work. You spent months researching this. When you get to the presentation, you've got to take that confidence, overcome fear you might have of standing in front of people, and project the ideas through evidence to convince the audience this is what you should do. This is what you should believe. And we'll practice that a little bit later. So we're going to plan appropriate visuals and effectively lead to Q&A. When you are standing here, like I'm doing now, and I'm presenting. Generally speaking, you are in 100% control of the audience. However, as soon as you say, now we move to Q&A, who has the first question? If you don't know what you're doing as a professional, you are out of control. And now the random chance of questions, the random chance of who's in the room, takes over and drives where we go next. If you don't know what you're doing. Now be that for JMAC or be that for in your business career, you never want to be out of control. You need to control what's going on. And we're going to teach you, I'm going to teach you today how to do that. So here are some reasons for being competent as a business professional. And I'm sure you look at this list. You feel in your profession that you're competent in your work. But if you stand up and you blow it, maybe your level of professional competency in the image of your audience goes down. So your professionalism is questioned. You don't want that to happen. Okay. Described as assertive. Assertive doesn't mean aggressive. It means confident and able to put forward an opinion 
to lead people, to guide people. Viewed as risk takers, standing up in front of people is a risk. Giving a presentation to an audience is a risk. <coughs> You're able to put yourself out there. Most people don't want to do that. Your confident reputation, when you see someone get up and give a great presentation, their whole credibility goes right up, their business reputation goes right up, and the reverse is the same. If they blow it, it goes straight down as well. Seen as professional, less stress, right? You want to be able to do these presentations without stress. Admired by your peers, particularly handling Q&A. If you are ever in an audience, in Japan it doesn't happen so often, but in Western audiences it happens, where it's a very, very acrimonious debate, very hot environment. People attacking the speaker. Happens. It can happen in companies when you've got political rivalries. People trying to go to the top over the bodies of their rivals, right? When you handle those attacks which are hidden inside the Q&A, hidden as questions, they're not really questions. They're attempts to embarrass you. When you can handle those, everybody else goes, wow, I wish I could do that. Or when they say also, man, I'm glad I'm not up there being attacked like that. I couldn't deal with it. So again, you can be admired by your peers through your credibility, your professionalism, and your capability. And demonstrate your leadership qualities. If you can't persuade people, how are you going to lead them? If you can't stand up here in front of people and talk to them, how are you going to lead them? Sit across the table from your team, how are you going to lead them? You've got to have that capacity to command an audience, be persuasive, and get people to come with you on the journey. And then able to motivate and inspire you are taking a company from where they are now, happily ensconced where they are now, to a new place. Because you've said, you know what? Your business is over here. We think it should be over here. Well, that's motivation, isn't it? They've got to change what they're doing and do something new. Most of us are not so great on doing something new part. Most of us are not so great on the change part. You're asking them to make a change. You have to inspire them. You have to motivate them to do that. You've got judges judging your plan. You need to motivate them to say, hey, this is a great plan. This is the winning plan. This is something that is going to really help this company grow its business. And finally, career advancement. If you cannot stand up in front of seniors in the company, and present credibly and professionally, they are not going to select you to be one of them. If you stand up in front of your industry peers and you cannot command that professional respect through your presentation skills, you have no credibility in your own industry. So these are not small things. This is a fundamental building block of our business careers. And for most of us, we never get training. We live in permanent state of fear and we fail to maximise the opportunities available to us for no good reason. Absolutely no good reason. So let's change that today. Let's get on the front foot. We might have a couple of people sitting alone there. See if you can find a group. Let's get into twos or threes. It doesn't matter. Amongst yourselves, form a little twos or threes there. I'd like you to think about what do you see are some qualities of outstanding presenters. We're not looking about average presenters, outstanding presenters. Let's have a little discussion in our groups. Qualities of outstanding presenters. Any questions on that? We all good? Let's go. Okay, thank you. So let's hear some ideas you have on what are some qualities of high level presentations. What do we have? Yeah. Uh, we thought that uh, storytelling and putting emotional points into it yeah. yeah, storytelling, emotional points. So it doesn't mean that your presentation has to be dry without the human dimension in your oral presentation. And telling a story about that client company or about their rivals or about their industry adds colour, 
for the judges, for the audience. Yeah, what else do we have? Sense of humor, ice breaking. Yeah, how how we begin? How we begin? Imagine your judges have been listening to a whole bunch of presentations. How are you going to differentiate yourself from the other groups, other teams that come before you? If it's your turn as the first of the day, how do you break in? If you're the last of the day, how do you break in? Yeah, that's going to make a big difference. Yeah, what else? Try not to use uh, difficult or technical words. Yeah, don't use jargon or technical words. And I think all of our companies are full of jargon, right? We use acronyms for everything. And you could have a whole sentence strung together with just acronyms, which everybody in the company understands. But often we forget that. With technical audiences, it might be fine. What about non-technical audiences? Yeah, what else? What else have we got? Yeah. Are oh, you waving to her or are you putting your hand up? <laughs> I'll take that as you're putting your hand up. Pardon? Not to write the answers on the slides of what you want to say. Yeah, you, it depends. I guess it depends on the presentation. Sometimes you may want to reveal them. Uh, as I'm about to in a moment. And what I mean is that uh, people don't listen to you. If ah, yes, yeah, so if you've got too much text up there, that's right. They read, the, they read the slide and they take no notice of you. Yeah, that's a good point. Now, I was told that, amazingly, in last year's presentations, people would actually try and put the entire presentation on one slide in micro font. <laughs> what could possibly be wrong with that, do you wonder, hey? Uh, and then would then others would then proceed to read the slide to the audience facing the slide so you know perceived as competent described as assertive viewed as you know this type of thing that's probably a winning formula for a presentation so if you want to lose try that if you want to win maybe don't do that yeah what else what are other some qualities of outstanding presentations yes Yeah, be concise, not repetitive. You might have some key points you want to drive home, but you do that in a way that's not rambling and not repetitive, but is powerful. Yeah, what else? Tap you all out? Yeah, one more, Kim. Um, like intonation and how... The how delivery, you yes. Really speak your words. Uh, many presentations I hear in Japan are delivered in a monotone. Guaranteed to put people to sleep. Guaranteed. Over a half an hour, wipes out most of the audience. So that fluctuation in voice is important. We'll talk about that a little bit later. Because often Japanese speakers, they think because Japanese is not a tonally varied language that you don't have that access to vocal variation like we do in European languages. Not true. I'll explain that a little bit later. One more. Last call. Yes, over here. Passion passion for the subject yes yes we believe what we feel in many cases we'll talk about congruency which is the aligning of what is being said with the delivery of how it's being said and passion plays a big part in that delivery component so here's some ideas came up from other groups Outstanding presenters, well prepared. Structure is good. Rehearsal is good. They know their subject. Tailored to the audience. Presentation is tailored to the audience. So depending on who's in the room, they sit the bar of complexity. And maybe language, maybe technical language, depending on who's in the audience. Speak in a good tempo. So it's not that monotone, very slow ups and downs, speed, control, fast, slow, variation, these types of things. The presentation is not memorized. It's a nightmare to try and memorize a presentation. Don't need to do it. There's no necessity to even try that. And you certainly shouldn't be trying that for your oral. You have your key points, talk to your points. The message is supported by evidence. 
you must have critical amounts of evidence in your document. Pull that out for your presentation and hit the high notes all the way along. Passion and eager to share. You mentioned about passion before. That's right. They want to share with the company. You spend a lot of time researching this. You want to share it with the judges because you want to win. Use personal stories to make points more compelling. That's right. We Storytelling is very powerful. It grabs our attention, brings us deep into the subject fast. Use movement to engage the audience. Could be the slide change. Like I'm using movement a little bit. I'm going forward and back a little bit. So rather than stuck in the one spot. I'm not pacing up and down so much, which can be very distracting, but I'm moving a little bit to come close to you and then back off a little bit. I haven't got much space here. Just trying to use a little bit of that space to have some projection to you as my audience. The little powerful opening and closing, just that first three, five seconds, last few seconds, very critical. The words and gestures are congruent. We'll talk about that in a moment. So what we say, how we say it, and the content must align. Display confidence. Even if you're not feeling confident, even if actually you're feeling terrified, don't show it. If you make a mistake, don't show it. If you say the wrong thing out of order, don't mention it. Right. If it gets a bit garbled, don't worry about it. Keep going. This is very, very important because your confidence will sell. And only you know what the order is. Only you know there was a mistake. So don't show that to your audience. And finally, appear relaxed and sincere. Relax because they are the professionals and the knowledge they've rehearsed. They have that passion to share and they're sincere and honest with their audience. So there's some features of outstanding presentations and these are some things we'll be looking to develop in our own professional career. Now this skill, attitude, knowledge triangle is very interesting. Particularly in technical professions, accountancy, medicine, law, architecture, engineering, huge bias on professional knowledge. To the point that People delude themselves that this is enough. If I'm a professional with deep knowledge, I don't have to, you know, I don't have to have the skill of a professional presenter. I don't have to have the attitude to care about my audience. If I turn up with a lot of really great information, that's good enough. Well, it's not good enough. And this is the big mistake, particularly people in those professions make. They think that what they're doing works. It doesn't work. And I'll talk about why it doesn't work in a moment. But when we do a study of this, they found that for people to be successful, 15% of their success was coming out of their degree of knowledge of their subject. But 85% is coming out of their skill set and their attitude, 85%. So relying just on your professional knowledge of your industry or your subject is not going to cut it in your career. So we have to really make sure the skill we have in our business and our attitude are right up there. And of course we need the knowledge, but we can't be a crutch, we can't rely just on that. So this is a very often misquoted set of statistics. Dr. Albert Moravian from UCLA in California did a study in the 1960s and he came up with these percentages that people formed a strong impression of the speaker through how they're dressed, how they look, 55%. 38% was through the vocal range Okay, how they spoke, but only 7% based on what they actually said, the actual content. Now, people start saying, well, yes, presentations, it's 55% how you look, it's 38% how you sound, and it's 7% of what you say. No, that's not correct. What Dr. Moravian said was, these numbers apply when we are not congruent now, the word congruent here means the content of what I'm saying 
and the way I say it are not matching up. And when they don't match up, I lose focus on the content and I get distracted by how people look and how they sound. If you are in that group of people who thinks that knowledge is critical and because you have professional deep knowledge that's enough, well you are only going to at max capture 7% of the audience. 93% are not going to recognize the high quality of what you're saying. You're losing 93% of your audience when it's not congruent. Now, give me an example. Kimo, can I borrow you? You can stay right there. Stay right there. Imagine I'm Kimo's boss. Okay. I walk up to Kimo and I say to Kimo, Kimo, I want to see you in my office in five minutes. I've got some good news for you. <laughs> what do you think is going to happen to Kimo? But if I wrote those words down, Kimo, I'd like to see you in my office in five minutes. I have some good news for you. Hearing that, Kimo might think, I'm getting a promotion. I'm getting a bonus. I'm getting a pay rise. I'm getting something good. Same words. But the first time I said it, I sounded, how did I sound? Sorry? Angry. I sounded angry, didn't I? Did I sound friendly? No. Did it sound good for chemo? No. Because what I was saying and the way I said it didn't match up. So you read my body language, didn't you? You read angry, stiff body language. You heard the tone of my voice was not friendly. I was looking at him in a very harsh way. You didn't hear what I said. Chemo. I want to see you in my office in five minutes. I have some good news for you. That's what I said. But you didn't hear that. The other distractions killed it. Now this is the problem. When you're presenting, if you're saying something in a way that is not matched by the way you're delivering it, people miss the message. So let's be congruent with what we say and how we say it. So if it's a really critical point and you say it in a very monotone, flat, passionless, manner, people won't switch onto it. But if you put some sincerity, some enthusiasm, some passion behind that statement where you're hitting key words, bang, communication goes right through the roof. You see that? I added some energy to what I was saying. I clicked my fingers on the indicator, both fingers going up. See, I was adding some strength to what I was saying through the way I was presenting it. So you naturally, you, you took that up as a high energy point. That's what I'm saying as opposed to flat, dead type of delivery. So where you've got key points in your presentation, you want to hit those hard with the judges. Don't deliver it in a monotone. Pick out critical words and hit those words harder than the surrounding words to give it more lift. Okay? That's what we mean by congruency. So the first section this morning, we're going to try and understand a little bit about fear and how we can reduce it, how to build rapport with the audience, how to communicate competence and confidence. And then uh, we're going to look at fear here. It's a tricky one because everyone, I think, as a speaker, experiences fear to some extent. If I'm standing here in front of an audience of 50,000 people, for example, I might have a higher level of anxiety than in front of 50 people. Right? It'll vary if for each of us. What would give us that level of anxiety? For me, one of the most anxious moments as a presenter is being asked to give the closing speech at a Dale Carnegie training regional convention. Happened a few years ago in Vietnam. Now, my audience is full of professional teachers of presentation skills. It's to a person. 
every single one of them. These are people who do this for a living, total professionals. Now, I'm speaking in front of them. That was a lot of pressure for me because I'm talking to my peers, but I'm talking to peers at an extremely high level. So even for people who are used to doing a lot of public speaking, there are levels where you will feel stress. But don't worry about feeling a bit of fear. We're all humans. We naturally feel fear. That flight or fight energy can be used as a presenter to get your point across, the passion behind the words. It doesn't have to be negative. You can channel that energy. You can channel that energy into your audience. A sign that you're conscientious, taking this seriously. Probably the worst presentation I attended was a number of years ago. Very well-known American guy. I, I known his name, he's a very prominent sort of guy. He was a speaker at an event. I went full of hope and promise. I was flabbergasted. I was absolutely flabbergasted. I was just amazed. He gave a presentation with no enthusiasm whatsoever. It was like he had agreed to do this for somebody as a favour but had no interest in the audience, uh, no interest in the subject for his audience. Oh, it was painful. It was really, really painful. So I didn't feel that guy was very conscientious about what he was doing. So sometimes that fear drives us to prepare very well, drives us to try harder. And signifies you want to make a good impression, well, because you're taking it very seriously. You're doing your best. You're putting yourself out of your comfort zone. And for most of us, we don't ever come out of our comfort zone. But when you're a speaker, you have to come out. And that's where the fear comes in. It shows you're committed and you care about the outcome. So this again, you're invested. That feeling of fear shows you're invested. Now one of the ways we can overcome the fear, and it might be a bit hard to read this, you might try it in your manuals, it might be a bit easier to read. Uh, have a look in your manuals on page, where are we? Page, looks like it's page, what is that? Page 16. Or is it 16 or 1.6? 1.6. Might be a little bit easier to read there. In the middle, we have preparation. And this is the critical part about overcoming fear, being fully prepared. And how do we prepare? We assess our audience. So, in your case, you have a judging panel as your audience for one presentation. You have company executives as another audience for your presentation. So you know who those audiences are. If you're giving a public presentation, you're asked to speak, you need to ask some questions. Who will be there? What's the gender ratio, male, female? What's the age group? What's their professional background? What industries are they from? What level of expertise do they have? You want to know all that stuff as part of your assessment. That will help you to know how to target what you want to convey. Then we go to the purpose and structure. We'll talk about this a bit later. What's the purpose of this particular talk? That will define how you structure the talk. So you need to be very clear on what is the purpose. And then I can't even read this one. So this projector from uh, Temple is so ancient. But it says opening and closing, yeah. And again, we said that before. First impression, last impression. Your content, key points and evidence, key point evidence, key point evidence. That structure is very, very critical. And then practice. Now, it's such an obvious thing. It's such an obvious thing. But people forget to practice. <coughs> See it all the time. They spend all of the time on the PowerPoint preparation. All of it. And they never practice running through it. They never practice rehearsal. So the first time to practice it is on their audience. Trust me, that is not a great place to do the practice. Better to practice on your peers or even in a mirror than do it on your audience. But people forget that. If you've done this, who's my audience? Who, what level do I need to talk at? What is the purpose? Very clear, that gives me the structure. I can have a great opening, great closing. I design that. I don't leave it a random chance. I design it. Then here's my opening key point evidence, key point evidence, key point evidence, 
close, then I go into do it, do it, do it, do it over and over again. That particular speech I gave in Hanoi, sorry, no, Ho Chi Minh, it's Ho Chi Minh, in Ho Chi Minh in Vietnam, I practiced that 15 times before I gave that presentation. The night before in my hotel, you know, in hotels, if you turn the lights out, the windows become like a mirror, and you can see yourself. So I'm gesturing to invisible people, imagining they're in my audience, seeing myself present, doing it over and over and over again, because I know who I'm facing in my audience. I know the level of those people. I know I must perform at a very high level, otherwise I have no credibility. Fifteen times. Now, it's only a ten-minute closing, but that's the type of thing you need to do, maybe not 15 times, at least five, before you do it. Now, if you're going to go on this presentation, and it's 30 minutes, and you haven't drilled this at least five times, you're kidding yourself. You may as well just take that 40%, kick it straight out the door, because you won't even come close. Those who practice more will win. That will be basically how it will be decided. Those who practice more will win. So make a choice. Do you want to win or not? Practice. So when we talk about preparing, so who is my audience? Purpose, open major points, closing. This is the basic structure, your analysis. My audience is the company executives, the judges. My purpose is to convince them. I'm going to open with something to break through all the clutter of the day before they get to me. Here are the key points. I've only got half an hour. I can't do everything. Pick out the gems. Where's my evidence to back up these ideas I'm suggesting they adopt? And how do I finish in a way that resonates with the judges and they remember it? Okay. So what knowledge do they have? Well, the company you're talking to will have infinitely great knowledge. Not total knowledge. You may have found things they don't know about. Because you may have looked at things in a way they hadn't considered. You may have done research they hadn't bothered to do. Everyone's busy. Companies don't have unlimited time and resources to do everything. So you have had months to work on this where they have not. Expertise, yes, they'll have a certain level of expertise, industry or, or specific. Experience, yes, your judges are very experienced. Your company individuals will be very experienced, of course. Prejudice, yeah, they may have certain views. The judges may doubt things that they read in your business plan. The company may be stuck doing things the old way all the time and think that you can't change. What do they need versus what do they want? Want, it may be nice to have. Need is you must have it. Now, often in companies, we get into the want to have because we haven't really analysed enough what we really need because we're too busy doing it. We say, work on your business not just in your business. There's a big difference. But as companies, we're very busy. We tend to be working in our business and forget to work on our business. You are our saviour here because you are working on our business from a completely neutral, external viewpoint, seeing things that we won't see. You know, I'm sure in your work environment, there are probably posters or things on the wall decorations, trees, plants, whatever. You don't even notice them. You don't even notice them. You go to work, you don't even notice them. Because they're there every day. Well, that's what happens with companies. We tend to not notice a lot of things because it's there all, it's too obvious. But someone from outside comes in and says, oh, look at that. That's got to be crack in it. Oh, really? Oh, I never noticed that before. That's the difference. You're going to notice the cracks. You're going to notice the things that are not obvious to them because they see it too often. So you have a, a huge opportunity to show what they need to be doing as opposed to what they think they want to do. And then goals. You know? What are the goals that the audience is trying to achieve? That company is trying to outdo their rivals. They're trying to survive. They're trying to make cash flow. They're trying to expand. They're trying to take market share. They're trying to improve their quality. They're trying to improve their customer service. There'll be a number of areas they want to improve. Internally more efficient, more productive, better retention of staff, ability to hire better people. All of those things will be goals, and hopefully you're going to talk about how they can achieve some of those goals, because they will 
hopefully want to hear that. So we're going to look at the purpose and structure. So what is the purpose structure of the presentation? How to organize your material. Logical progression of ideas. So I said before about purpose. Now, in this particular case, because you're talking to that company, you're talking to the judges, you really want to be up here, convince, persuade. That's your objective. Follow our plan. Take our suggestions. Do what we recommend. That's your objective. But in other cases in your professional life, your presentations may just be to inform, maybe to update on progress on a project. It might be to update on what's happening in the marketing. Could be anything like that. It may not be to persuade, it might be just to inform. Or it might be to motivate. You might be having an internal meeting. First half of the financial years run through, you've got six months to go. You need to motivate your team to push hard over the last six months. Different type of talk. Or it might be to entertain. In some cases, you know, your audience are not looking for anything particularly more than being entertained. It might be very humorous, it might be a lot of storytelling in it, it may not have a lot of factual data and information, but that's a particular type of audience that you need to think about. So which purpose is relevant for your audience? Understand that first, and that will help you in your structure. So again, this is a very simple structure. Opening, okay, the content, the points you're going to make, your evidence, back it up, and your closing. Sounds very simple, but it's got to be very concise, got to be very fluent in delivery, it's got to be very powerful, it's got to be very passionate, in your delivery to make it work. So planning the presentation, the opening is going to grab attention, evidence, persuade, closing is going to connect and leave a lasting impression. So let's look at that. So in a moment, I'm going to ask you to start designing a presentation, which you're going to give to each other in a very short period of time. We'll start that. Now the topic today for you as presenters will be the key things I have learned from doing JMEC. That's your topic today. You're going to present on that topic two minutes to each other. The key things I have learned from doing JMEC. That's your topic. So, how will you open that presentation? Here are some ideas. One would be something that's rather surprising. Something that an audience would not expect. A statement that you would make that would really surprise them and rock them a little bit. Might be a puzzle. Might be something that gets people thinking, well, I don't quite get that. I want to hear more about that. Could you explain that a bit further? I'm trying to get your audience in. It could be an event. It could be relating something that happened uh, say your visit to the company, it could be uh, something that happened with your team, for example, it could be something that happened in your workplace related to what was happening in your JMEC, some support from your boss or your teammates or obstruction from your boss <laughs> or your teammates at work, something that happened in your JMEC world that's relevant for this talk as an opening. So you know this is a storytelling part right there, or the no nonsense might be Today I'm going to talk about three things, and then you say it's boom, boom, boom. A type of agenda opening. Now you've only got two minutes. That's not a long time, but that's enough for you to go through the practice we're going to do. So take a few moments now, and we're going to design that opening. Either something that's a big surprise. JMEC caused my divorce. <laughs> it could be quite possible, actually, given the time you have to put into this. That's a very surprising statement. You want to hear more about that, right? My wife left me because of Jamie. <laughs> My husband left me because of Jamie. Or whatever it might be, you know. A puzzle, something that is going to go to our attention. I found the secret to business success. That's a puzzling statement. I found the secret to business success doing Jamie. Well, what is it? What is that secret? I want to know. 
See? Like right that came up. Oh, I was going to say, should we include all of that? <coughs> no, just pick one. Just pick one. It's only an open. This might be 10, 15 seconds. You've only got, in this case, two minutes. And as you said before, you've only got three to five seconds, as you discovered yourselves, to get that first impression. This is to break into the mind of your audience. Now, the judges will either have arrived in the morning and be incredibly grumpy because it's morning and it's early and it's a weekend. They have just come back from lunch because now they're sleepy and tired. It's the last presentation of the day they're angry because between you and beer, beer at clock time is one presentation. You know, might be the second day they're even more angry the second day of the morning because they're really tired now and it's early, etc, etc. You get the point? So you've got a limited window. If you're talking to the company, the sponsoring company, They've got a whole bunch of stuff floating around in their heads about the work day. You're probably talking to them at night after work. Their minds are already chewed up with a whole bunch of other stuff. You have to jump in there, open up some space, and get your presentation into their mind. Right. That's not so easy. So your opening is how you do that. Your opening cuts between what has happened up to the point of you turning up and what's going to happen for the next part of this presentation. That's the opening you have to create in the mind of your listener. Okay, got the idea? Any other questions? Okay, I'm going to give you one minute to pick one of these and think about your opening of your two minute presentation on what you've learned from Jamie. All good? Let's go. So you've had a bit of an opportunity to think about how you're going to open, break through the clutter in the mind of your audience. So, we talked before about key points. You've done the research. You've spent the time. You've come up with things in your document which are the key points of what you've found. And I'm hoping that attached to those statements are points of evidence to back it up. So, when you get to your actual presentation, we say evidence defeats doubt. Your audience doubts what you say. The judges will doubt what you say. The company will doubt what you say unless there is evidence to support your statement. Because this product had a huge market share in England, we expect it will have the same market share in Japan. Oh yeah? Really? Well, that's a statement. Where's your evidence to back that up? A statement by itself, very weak. You need to have that concrete evidence. So what sort of evidence can we draw on? An evidence, depending on what it might be in terms of your product or service, it could be a demonstration. It could be something that you can actually show how it works as part of your evidence. See, this works in Japan. You can show it. It could be some examples you give of where it's worked elsewhere or where it's been successful elsewhere, in Japan, for example. It could be some hard facts, right? Some things you've found through your market research to support the point that you're making. Could be an exhibit, you know, it could be something like this. You hold it up, you can show it to people, you know, they can see it. One of the groups I was mentoring had a very exciting product, it was pumps. Pumps. Think about that, pumps. Pumps that go in machinery, that, uh, in the food processing industry. Now they brought in micro pumps this big, and they brought in very large pumps, weighed about you know, 10 kilograms, they were huge. So for the judges, they had to line up on the table of this sort of array of different size pumps. Now pumps, I don't know about you, I don't get too excited about pumps normally. But uh, it was quite fascinating actually. They had the physical pump there, these big ones and these tiny ones. To give the judges an idea that this was the product we're talking about here as an exhibit, it worked very effectively. Analogies. Analogies are where you talk about two different things which are not connected, but you draw them together for impact. 
For example, I could draw an analogy. Public speaking is like flying a light plane. When you go and get your pilot's license flying a light plane, you very rapidly discover the most critical points in the flight are the takeoff, just like in public speaking, we talked about the opening, and then the landing, the close, the final impression. So, for public speaking like flying, the beginning and the ending are critical points in the success of that endeavour. So I've taken public speaking and flying a light aircraft, two totally unrelated things, and I've brought them together by way of an analogy to give you an idea about a particular point I want to make about openings and closings in your speaking. Okay. Testimonials. Now this again, uh, if you go to our website, you'll see Warren Buffett. I think, everyone heard of Warren Buffett? Just had the big, uh, big gathering in, uh, in the States for uh, his, uh, his company. Very famous businessman. He's a big fan of Dale Carnegie. He's a graduate of Dale Carnegie. There's numerous videos of him saying how great we are. That's a fantastic testimonial for us. It's on our website. So in your presentation, you might be quoting experts. You might be quoting uh, thought leaders, industry leaders, well-known personalities who support the view that you're putting forward. So that would be a testimonial you could use. Or it could be statistics. You've gone and looked at the uh, official documents, the statistics, drawn out the key data, and then you've put that data together in a graphic form or a, uh, a particular way of expressing that to an audience that's very effective. Like I had before, I talked about skill, attitude, and knowledge, and I put some percentages to those. 85% skill and attitude, 15% knowledge. Right? So I'm using statistics there to justify that point I'm making as a way of evidence on what the research showed. So that's some things you can think about when we talk about evidence. It doesn't have to just be what you say. You may be able to show things. So we get to our closing. But before that, uh, think about the points you're going to make. OK, you've only got two minutes. So you're probably only going to get through three, four major points maximum. Before we design the closing, though, I want you to pick out some of those key points you're going to make in that two-minute talk. All right, just, just bullet points. Don't write a big sentence, just bullet points, and then we'll talk to those bullet points, OK? So think about the key points. What are the things you learned through JMEC? What are some key points? Who's got the first question? We're all good on that? We've designed the opening. Now we're going to design, think about what the key points are, then we'll design the closing. All good? OK, let's go. OK, let's move on so we can get some practice in. Now, let's design the close. So we're using an, uh, an acronym here, C-L-O-S-E, for close. But the close could be a challenge to the audience. It could be something like, join JMEC yourself and grow your business career. This is what my colleagues and I found, and I hope you can find the same thing. So you challenge them to join and join the next group of JMEC aspirants, for example. It could be to loop back to your main purpose. Your main purpose may have been, uh, this is really a journey, very unusual journey, something unique in our business careers, doesn't come up very often, really grow through this experience. So you come back to what might be your key, key message you want to get across. Might be inspiration or benefit, it could be um, Learn how to step up inside your own company by having a bigger perspective on the business than just being in a narrow division or unit where you're working. Now you can step back and see the big picture. It might be just a summary that's very succinct. The key points were A, B, C. That's it. Right? Or you might exaggerate and dramatize it. You're only going to get one chance with your JMEC. Don't blow it. Get in there and do it and be one of successful alumni like we are who've taken our careers to the next level. Something like that. So you're very passionate, inspiring people, exaggerating or whatever it might be, dramatizing whatever it might be. So there's some things to think about for the closing. So you've got an opening, you've got some key points. Now think about those key points, how do you want to close it out? Do you want to challenge, loop it back, be inspirational, summarize, or do you want to dramatize it? 
take a couple of moments and think about how you want to finish this off. Last impression now. What's the last impression you want to leave with your audience? Last thing they hear and see from you, what should that look like? That's the first question on doing the close. All good? Okay, let's design the close. Okay, we'll move along and we'll get into our practice in a moment. So this is a mini version of what you'll do in your half an hour with the judges. You're going to have how we're going to break through the clutter, get into their minds, what key points are we going to present with evidence, how we close it out to be memorable. Because immediately they finish with you, they get together and then they discuss about your presentation and give you a score right there, right then. And then at the end, they'll do a sort of amalgamation of all the scores to balance it out. So that last impression before they walk out the door to start judging you is going to be very critical to how they're going to give you a, a point score. So don't want to miss that. Now I'll talk a little bit about visuals. I'm not going to talk a great deal about it because I'll explain about this whole video on this, but visuals can be PowerPoint, can be flip charts, can be whiteboards, can be pumps, it could be any number of things, depending on the product or service that you're talking about. And try and make them interesting. And I'll talk a little bit about Q&A uh, in a minute as well. But probably the easiest thing, given the time we've got, is if you go to this address, okay? And this has come out on the slides that Betsy's going to send you, but it's japan.dalecarnegie.com forward slash jmac forward slash. On that page are Japanese versions and English versions of an hour long presentation with slide deck narration on how to do PowerPoint. Now, amazingly, amazingly, last year, despite having six people in a group, this group obviously didn't bother to look at the video, they were putting up every slide a yellow background with white font. Now you'd have to ask yourself what sort of suicidal <laughs> extreme tendencies JMEC had driven that group to <laughs> to kill themselves off at the final stage and snatch defeat from the jaws of victory by doing that to themselves. It's not rocket science but simple things like colour dark font, dark background, light font, things like limited number of things on a page. Many pages fine, but not everything on the one page. Not having nine graphs on one page, have one graph on one page. Simple things like this. This one hour video, either Japanese version or English version, goes through all of this in detail and takes you through what you need to do. These are simple things. Don't do it the hard way. All right? So I'll leave you to look at that. And there's also an earlier video of this presentation on that site as well. So if you want to review the things I'm talking about today, you'll see that. And I may get this video up before you go to uh, judgment. Judge, judging will be held how far away is it? No, when? Oh, so there's still some time. You've got time to practice and okay. Well, it'll be up. It'll be up before that and I'll get it stuck up, up on this side as well. But the one that's there is basically pretty much the same content. All right, so have a look at that. So when we talk about Q&A, uh, Q&A is an opportunity for you to drive home parts of your message in more detail. You don't have much time, half an hour, you've got to cover quite a bit. As a question pops up, that gives you a chance to really go after it. And hopefully, my recommendation is you have a limited number of people presenting. Pick your best presenters. If you want to be democratic and give everybody a shot, that's fine, but you better be good because you're going to be up against a team who put their best people up and the judges only have to concentrate on them. 
might just be one person, might be two people, might be three, but you start getting more than that, it really has to be managed well. And the key message there has got to be very clear in the group. Who's going to answer what? So when you're sitting there, arrange your seats so that as the people are presenting, you can see the judges' faces. Watch them like a hawk. Watch them like a hawk. Watch how they react to different pieces of the presentation and start thinking, oh, is that going to flag a question? Is that going to flag some trouble? before they ask it. When they ask it, there should be an MC in your group, someone who's directing traffic. That person will take the question, then they'll direct it to, Betsy will answer that part, Greg will answer that part, John will answer that part. You direct who will answer it. Beforehand, you've broken it up. You'll take this, I'll take this, you'll take this. You know what you're going to cover. You know who's going to answer what, so it's not a shambles. And in that little bit of phrasing of Greg will take that section, Greg has got a few seconds to get the brain working and think about the response as opposed to being caught short. So plan that. Questions give you a chance to clarify key messages. Don't miss that chance to clarify them. Chance to reinforce some key points. They may ask a certain question. It'll give you an opportunity to answer that, but also hit a couple of other strong points in addition to that. Politicians do that to some extent. Politicians don't usually answer the question at all, but they put up the points they want to talk about. Don't do that. Answer the question, but you can add other strong points to it. The questions will flag any things that haven't been clear enough in the document or clear enough in your presentation today that needs more work. Maybe they're not accepting your view. Uh, get your chance to interact with your audience, of course. But again, you control it. So when you start, how many minutes they've got? 30 minutes for questions, I think? Yes, 30. Okay, you, you say, the MC says, we have 30 minutes for questions. Who has the first question? You control the question time. Don't let the judges control it. You tell them, we have 30 minutes for questions. Who has the first question? Thank you. Next question. Thank you. Next question. You take control. You understand that? Don't stand there passively. You take control. Get some time. Who has the last question? Be in control of the time. Okay. And provides opportunity to add extra evidence, as I said before. So with your question time, uh, I suggest that you stand. So you've got your MC and you're all lined up there and the MC can pass it off to you to answer the question. Then they can then move on to say who has the next question. Because they determine that question has now been answered. They say, okay, you've answered that question. We're done. Move on. Who has the next question? You think they are in control. Don't let the judges control it. You need to control it. Right. So... We have so much time for questions. Now, this applies to any presentation you're doing. If you don't nominate how much time we have, you run into this problem. You've got a very hostile audience, or you've got people in the audience who are hostile to you. They disagree entirely with what you're saying. They're attacking you. And then you say, well, I have to go now. It looks like you are a coward. It looks like you can't take it. It looks like you're running away. You don't know how to answer their questions. You're bailing out. You look weak. As opposed to, we have 10 minutes for questions. We have 15 minutes for questions. Five minutes for questions. Last question. Thank you. Restate your clothes again and then leave. You look like you're in control. And you've told them how much time there is, so it's legitimate to say, time up, I've got to go. If you don't do that and you've got a hostile audience, you look weak and you look like you're escaping. Don't put yourself in that position. <coughs> that won't happen with the judges. But in any other audience, it may happen. Okay. So who has the first question? You listen, repeat, rephrase. Now, the beauty of this is you've got an MC who's passing it on to you, so you get a little bit of thinking time. 
If you don't have that situation where there's an MC handing the question intake, you can say things like, yes, it is important how the budget is allocated. You make a neutral statement. You won't upset anybody. Give yourself some thinking time. The distance between your ear and your mouth is very close. So we often tend to hear something, particularly if we're feeling it nervous, and we tend to come out with an immediate response. I'm sure all of us have had the experience of having said something and then thought, you know what, I shouldn't have said that. Or you know what, I could have said that a better way. Or you know what, I forgot to say this. Or it often happens like, you know, two hours later, you get us some genius response that you should have used, but you didn't get a chance to use it. Too late. So by giving yourself a little filler word there, a little sentence, you know, how we allocate the staff for this project is very important to the company. <coughs> Neutral statement, thinking time, not your first response, go to your second or third response and bring that out. So the same here, where well, you might paraphrase the question. Even the MC has handed the question off to you, you might give yourself a little bit more thinking time and just paraphrase the question. So the question was, why didn't we allocate money in the budget for the PR campaign? Right? Just to give yourself a little bit of thinking time to clarify. Then, after all of that, respond. Be very careful about instant response in any situation. Try and give yourself a little bit of thinking time to build in there. Next question. Now, if there are, in this case, there'll definitely be questions from the company or from the judges. But if you're in a situation where there are no questions, you say, ask for questions, silence. A question I am often asked is, and you have your own question, state it, then you answer it. Who has the next question? Because often people are not brave enough to ask the first question. So you ask it, and then you ask them, and they'll, you'll always be surprised. People will suddenly put their hand up for ask the second question. All right, so have that prepared. Who has the final question? Time. Who has the final question? Judges. We're getting a time. Our final question from the judges. Control it. Then go back and reiterate your closing key points. So there are actually, in the speaking, there are two closes. Opening, key point evidence, key point evidence, key point evidence, close, Q&A, close again. The reason we do that is we stay in control. If you don't, the content of the last question determines the last impression. As you know, an audience can ask anything they like. They can take the entire discussion completely off subject, off track, onto something absolutely irrelevant to what you're talking about, and that's where you leave it. No, you stay in control. No matter what they say, no matter what they talk about, no matter where they take you, however tangential, at the end you bring it right back to the key point you want to make, and that is the last impression you leave your audience with. That is how you maintain control. It won't be an issue in this particular case with the judges. It probably won't be a case with the company. But in your presentations that you're doing as professionals, this definitely will happen. People will divert you. People will distract you. Bring it back. So there are two closes we need to have right, when we design. In this case, for the two minutes we're going to do in a moment, we won't get that much time, but you just need one close. Right? Got the idea? You're all good? So we are going to get into groups of three in a moment, triads. But just before that, I'm going to give you a moment or two just to reflect yourself. Here's how I'm going to open it. Here are the key points I'm going to make. Here's how I'm going to close it. And then we're going to get up and do that. Everyone good? Everyone clear? Everyone fine? Any questions? All right. Reflect on what you're going to deliver. Okay, looks like we're almost ready. Just before we go into that, I'm going to take you through some of the mechanics of speaking. These are guidelines on those little blue cards I gave you. This is something you can keep in 
your purse or your wallet anytime you have to get up and give a talk you can refer to this I'll just explain what each one means briefly the first one is about eyes this is about eye contact it says six seconds and six sectors it talks about making eye contact with someone for about six seconds one or two seconds is rather fleeting you can't really connect with anyone longer than six seconds becomes a bit intrusive staring at someone they start to feel uncomfortable like you're some sort of crazy axe murderer or something staring at them around about six is a good balance six sectors a bit like with a uh, baseball diamond left field center field right field inner field outer field there are six pockets there the point is to be talking to every part of your audience not just this side of the room or the front part of the room get everybody involved right that's what that means the second one there we talk about uh, the face this is again being congruent if it's a uh, an unhappy or sad situation don't smile <coughs> not congruent look look like what you're talking about worried or depressed show the face if it's happy look happy so you get your face to be moving now for Japanese people I know this is a bit of a challenge because you're not encouraged to do that when you're speaking you're supposed to be very poker face but get some animation in the face hit certain words with some passion and energy try and get the face involved as well it's very powerful in fact the face the face is so much more powerful than this now you notice I'm standing I'm standing over here notice the podium is set up by, all the equipment is set up over there because this room is set up by people who don't know about public speaking they're academics okay. we read and increasingly today in Japanese we read left or right so English left or right look at my face read the screen look at my face read the screen not concentrate on the screen concentrate on me and when your face is animated it helps people to look this is the screen this is the key most powerful most persuasive screen you've got your face your eyes and your facial expression very very powerful don't miss that next one there is our our voice I said before Japanese uh, it's a monotone language therefore you might think well you can't have tonal variety that's not correct you can put in strength on keywords and take it out <coughs> take the strength away on keywords as well you can really speed it up you can slow it down so even though Japanese doesn't have a tonal variation through speed and power you've got levers to have tonal variety so you don't kill an audience and put them to sleep so we're looking for that tonal variety we're looking for things that are not monotone two about gestures now preferably with gestures this is a great place to have your hands if you're using your voice your face and your eyes no one even notices where your hands are so people are very self-conscious about their hands what do I do with my hands if you're using this part eyes and voice no one even looks at your hands so when you bring your hands out bring them up but don't hold a gesture for longer than 15 seconds because after 15 seconds all the power of that gesture dies and it looks annoying <laughs> so it's like a tap you turn it on turn it off turn it on turn it off so you bring them up put it away you bring it up you put it away you bring it up you put it away on off on off there's variety there and again the congruency what you're saying gestures you're talking about some high or large amount that's a good gesture for something low this is a good gesture this is a good gesture this is a good gesture depending on what you want to say so you match the gesture with the content so it's congruent 15 seconds maximum though next one there is pausing when we are nervous we tend to speed up we tend to become a little bit faster than we are normally speaking pauses are good 
it allows our audience to catch up with what we've been saying and digest it. It allows us to regroup and prepare what we're about to say. Nobody in an audience is going to complain about pauses. Hey, you stop talking for five seconds. That's not allowed. No one's going to say that. If you stop talking for five seconds, they'd be happy about it. Gives them a chance to think about what you just said. There was a pause there. Doesn't seem unusual, does it? It's quite natural. So that continuous talking is different. I had an Indian gentleman in one of my high impact presentation classes. First speech was three minute speech. Didn't stop. There was no pause. It was constant for three minutes. Couldn't believe it. At the end of that two day high impact presentations class, he was brilliant. He had pauses, he had variation, he slowed it down, sped it up. It was terrific. What a difference from a guy who just spoke continuously for three minutes, not a break anywhere, and very fast with a very strong Indian accent. It was pretty tough for the audience, but he really worked on that. And where you do have an accent, I tend to speak quickly. I have to really remember when I'm speaking in Japanese to slow down to help my Japanese audience adjust to my Aussie accent when I speak Japanese. Right? The same, if you're speaking English, you might need to do the same thing. If we're English native speakers, we need to slow down too to let our audience capture what we're saying. And then, uh, finally there, we're talking about posture. There are different audiences, different occasions, different environments. But generally speaking, if you want to look professional, this probably won't do it for you. It looks a little bit too casual, a little bit out of place in a business context. Normally about, about maximum about shoulder width. Both legs straight, but the knees slightly relaxed, not stiff. Right? And stand up straight. And you use your head rather than this to look at your audience. And I see people do that. And pacing up and down, you often see speakers up and down, up and down, because they're very nervous. That's why they're pacing up and down. They're not in control. And boy, does that get annoying very fast. So it might be a little bit of movement, not too much. You don't have to be in the one place all the time. But good, strong, straight posture is good. And for ladies too, you know. This is probably good. This is probably not so great. Looks a bit too casual. Ladies tend to do this a lot, I notice. Probably don't want that one. Probably this is probably all you need. This is probably all you need. Okay. There's some of the mechanics. So when we're doing this, we're going to give each other some feedback. Now, there's only two types of feedback allowed here. In Dale Carnegie, only two types of feedback. We're going to tell each other what we were doing that was good. As the viewer of the presentation, what do we like about it we thought was good? Because sometimes we'll be doing something that's quite good, we're not even aware of it. So, oh, is that good? Oh, I'll keep doing that. Or if we're doing something we're aware of, we get some reinforcement to keep doing it. The other thing is, we're going to do this presentation again, very shortly. How can we make it even better? How can we improve it? How can we make it better? So good, better, good, better. No critique. No criticism. No whining, no arguing, no whinging, all right? Positive, positive, positive. Got the idea? Okay, who found this easier to do the third time compared to the first time? That's rehearsal. That is practice. Working on the PowerPoint does not help you as much as doing this helps you when it comes to delivery. And I said at the beginning, nothing in your hands. And people looked at me like, nothing in my hands? Impossible. But you did it because you had the content. You lived through this experience. You know what you're talking about. You don't need anything in your hand to read. It's all in your mind. You've lived through this experience. You've written this document. 
you've prepared your presentation, you know what is in there. There are certain things you're going to talk to. You know what they are. The PowerPoint can be an order setter for what's coming next. So you don't even have to remember it. As long as you don't put too much in each PowerPoint, let it roll itself out. So when you get to the case of delivering for the company and the judges, you don't need anything in your hands. Use your eyes to look at your audience. Use your hands to gesture to your audience. Get that face animation going. Connect with your audience. These are the things that will make you outstanding as a presenter. We have seven minutes for questions. Who has the first question? <laughs> <laughs> yes, please. Can I talk to the audience? Some of them didn't understand one of the specific prompts I used. So I want to link in the real uh, presentation how much pure knowledge you expect that the judges to talk. Are they usually all run through the business plan? So the question is about use of technical terms or specific terms. In your case, you're working off a written document, which is your business plan, which you are presenting to the judges. They are not lazy. They are very passionate people. They are really passionate about ripping your business plan into <laughs> tiny little shreds and finding every possible weakness in your argument and trashing everything you say. That's what they're passionate about. So trust me, they'll be looking for things to argue with you about. So they will know exactly what you're talking about. But if you have an audience who are not familiar with the business plan like your particular judging audience will be, be careful about using terms or if you use them, explain what they are for your audience so they can follow on. But in this particular case, don't worry. They will have been looking in great depth at everything you said. Who has the next question? Thank you. I thought I saw a question over here. I had a similar question. Similar question, yes. Same, 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 same answer. So. Okay, we're good. Who has the next question? Um, yeah. When it comes to questions, um, the judges are going to dig in. Uh, if we get to a situation where completely go mind blank, you don't know what to say. As a presenter, in terms of good presentation skills, how do you overcome that kind of situation? You're very lucky in this case. The question is about, uh, I get a very tough question. Judges are digging in and I go blank. I can't think of an answer. In your particular case, you're very lucky. You hand it straight back to the MC. You have an MC in your group. If you get to a point where you can't answer that, you hand it back to the MC, give yourself a little bit of thinking time. They will probably be very calm, cool and collected and relaxed because they're seeing you answer it, they're also thinking of the answer, they'll have an answer. But then if you want to add something later to that, you can do it. If you get to a point where you don't have this particular situation, it's a real audience who are not judging panel, and you get a very hard question and you really haven't got a good answer, you can just say, well, I don't really have a full answer for you at this moment. Let me think about that a bit more and I'll come back to you. Who's the next question? <laughs> and you move on. You, then you said, I don't have a full answer for you at this moment. I will think about it a bit further and I will come back to you. And then you very smoothly and elegantly move on. Who has the next question? <laughs> this becomes important if the question is actually a hostile question and maybe you get a bit flustered. You know, you really have a gall coming here tonight and giving us this talk, with the lack of preparation you've done for this, stand up in front of all these people giving up their time to listen to you, and you insult us. We have absolutely no knowledge of the subject. That's, that's completely obvious. So really, tell me, how can you make that statement? That is absolutely ludicrous. Now, you get that sort of treatment. Your mind might go blank very easily. You might be flustered. You might be really at a loss. That can happen. So you need to have a situation where you can deal with that and say, well, thank you for your feedback. I appreciate that. Maybe let's take the discussion offline. Who has the next question? Move on. Move on. Don't debate. Don't argue. Move on. That's how you get yourself out of trouble. Don't get into an arm wrestle with that person. Accept what they say, but don't debate it. And who has the next question? Yeah. 
how do the how should the MC properly pass the question on to somebody else? Mm -hmm. Like, what would be? Uh, Debbie, thank you very much for that question. The person to answer this would be Greg. Like that. Just like that. And you know in advance that it's going to be Greg. Because that's Greg's section. So you're all prepared to go anyway. Then I get a bit of thinking time, how I'm going to answer that. Hand it off to me. Then I answer it. And then if we need to, we might say, uh, one of you might put your hand up and have an extra answer that you want to give in the group who wasn't the designated person to take that question. You may have be thinking of some very good answer or a better answer maybe than what that person came up with on the spot and they put their hand up and you say, yes, I think, uh, I think Betsy looks like she'd like to add to that. Betsy, what have you got to say? And just like an MC, just very smoothly, you be in control. Don't let the audience or the judges control it. You control it. Okay, here's the next question. Like I'm doing just now. Yeah, go ahead. I'm just wondering how to make a, move, a smooth connection. For example, uh, the, uh, the one who answered the question uh, has no enough detailed answers, and the other person wants to supplement the answers. How, how can we make a good connection? The question is how can we make a smooth transition when you've got someone who's designated to answer the question and the other person wants to add something? I think in that case, if you are. Let's say you should, be, you should be standing. Don't be seated when you answer the question. Stand, right? And have your MC on one side so you can see the MC and they can see you. Because it's very hard when you're in a line. Uh, John, could you answer that? It doesn't work very well, right? You want the MC over here. You want your panel lined up here so they can see the judges too, right? So the judges' panel's here. Your panel's there. MC's here so they can see everybody. Then they hand it off, and then they'll notice that someone's just put their hand up within the group who wasn't designated to answer the question, indicates, I want to add something. Then they say, oh, OK, yes, uh, Bill, you look like you want to add something. Please go ahead. Just like that. And the MC is the control. That way, there's no confusion. You can see, the MC has got to be able to see the judges, see their own panel. The panel has got to be able to see the judges and the MC. So you need to set the room up like that for question time. Who has the final question? <laughs> See how this works? It's so easy, isn't it? We have no more questions. Are we on the final question? Yes? Should we like um, update the, um, I forgot the name of the person, but like Debbie, with how much time is left? And the judge, you mean? Yeah, the, the judge. The question is, should we reference to the judge how much time is left? No. Okay. Uh, they know. They know. But well, standing between your question and their coffee break is only your question. So they will have it down to the nanosecond. <laughs> They'll know exactly how much time is left. You're in control. If you pull it up at one minute off the time, you know, one minute early, you pull it up. You are in control. So, you know, final question, it might go a little bit over, go a little bit under. You can't control that. The answer you can control. So you designate what happens. That way it goes very, very smoothly. Judges will appreciate it. Judges will appreciate someone holding them to time, making sure the whole exercise is run smoothly. We are at time. I wish you good luck. I will see you at the award ceremony. I hope that the reports I get back from the judges this year are referencing the video of how to do the PowerPoint so we don't have any crazy stuff on the PowerPoint. I hope that you do lots of rehearsal, as we've just done. Give yourselves good, better feedback. Make it a safe and positive environment for each other to aid each other to work through the rehearsal. Work out who's going to speak. Work out who will be the MC. Choreograph it, practice it, prepare it. Look forward to seeing you at the ceremony. Good luck. Thank you. Thank you.